I can add one. I was going to say, oh. come on up. He's, he's the man on the ground. This guy you shouldn't work. let him talk. <laughs> My name is Mayor Schechter, and I've been the project manager on site for the three and a half years of the procurement. Um, I'm going to tell you about my first meeting here. And Peggy Plett was at that meeting, and she said, one of the important things is that CalSTRS has to adapt to the system, not the system adapt to CalSTRS. And to this day, three and a half years later, I think that is a key to the success of this project. There will be the tendency and the push to always make this system exactly, exactly what CalSTRS wants to every detail. And that's when a implementation can get out of control. Okay? You've bought a system that's being used by 20 systems, 20 other pension systems. It's a system that has developed processes and procedures that are used successfully by other systems. And it's very important to learn the lessons learned that have been built into the system for the past 10, 15 years. So yes, there are certain things that have to be customized for CalSTRS. The calculation has to be CalSTRS calculation. But how the system is used okay, is something that you have a great deal of flexibility in. And not only will you learn lessons learned from the way it is being done by others, but you will also create consistency in the way CalSTRS does things. And that's very important to the success of the project. Can I just stop ask? Stop. I, I, just one, one other question is, um, in terms of oversight, since this is a, such a large project, we're, when you talk about the IPOC, that's Graham Thornton. And so I know Graham's in the audience somewhere. Hi, Graham. Um, so Graham will be giving us, that's the, the plan for, in terms of kind of regular reporting and oversight for the board moving forward is going to be through Graham giving us regular updates at board meetings. Is that? OK. Thanks. Ms. Dillon. So to all four teams, everybody involved on staff, bravo, yeah. because this has been a long time coming. Yeah. And much support and uh, encouragement as we go forward and actually go through the implementation of it, because I was there when START started. <laughs> <laughs> and how ironic that I came to the board and we, it was just finally implemented. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of, that's sweet, po that's poetic, I have to say. Um, I, I do have a concern, and, and I know that we've built in some very robust security features, but we've, we talked, I, I can't recall within the write-up about the vendor-hosted option, and I think that we can protect and try to protect our information as, as best we can. Um, but are we doing anything in case something does happen? So I guess what I'm asking is, you know, my world is being a librarian with my collection and kids checking books in and out. I always had a backup of my collection and the activity in the collection. Are we going to have a backup on a regular basis of the information that we keep on our members in case something does happen? Every five minutes kind of, you know will have and what we'll do in I think in April we have a closed session in the security I think we can add this one to give you a little bit more comfort okay you know what we're trying to do what kind of layer of security we are putting so we can right. provide that one thanks Anisha appreciate that and if I might add, disaster recovery was a component in our RFP and something that we expected the vendors to be considerate of and um, tell us their plans relative to. So we were trying to um, anticipate that it's not just a system. It is, has to meet a multitude of needs, including disaster recovery needs. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so, well, congratulations also to um, to the four of you and, and all of the teams, everybody in the room who's um, done so much work on this. You know, a lot of it happened before I had the opportunity to, to join the board. Um, but congratulations. Um, I just I wanted to underscore some of the comments that um, Controller Yi and, and Ms. Hendricks have made about the the need for transparency. Um, you know, if the if going forward, um, reporting uh, in terms of progress on implementation will be handled through. Um, you know, Graham's reports or the regular business renew oversight assessment. Because I, I wanted to ask if we could consider um, putting more detail into that. Um, you know, we've you, you've outlined number five or six different 
issues that you highlighted that we're looking at or, or planning to do in terms of risk mitigation, change management, um, project management, cybersecurity. We've heard about the importance of testing and monitoring those testing cycles to make sure they go well. And I think the, the current reports that we get, um, you know, which might show green or green yellow for the overall project, I, I'm really interested in seeing, you know, within that, what are some of the components that are on track, haven't started, completed, bright red, uh, and, and just making sure that we're, we're aware uh, of the progress and aware of any, uh, any risks that we have. Those are great comments, and I think Graham will be able to address that a little bit during his uh, report today, because we are actually on track. We're having discussions on how we expand that report to make it a little bit more, because we know how important and visible it is, so how can we make it a little bit more um, additional detail without overloading you with detail? It's finding that balance. Thank you. Mr. Unterman. Thank you. Uh, I want to congratulate the staff. I think it's just been as well structured and uh, conducted uh, project conceptualization and, pro and bidding process as you can do. So great. I personally am hoping to hear nothing but uh, everything's fine from now on. That's right. That's right. And a pony. Yeah. Um, <laughs> get you a pony. But I, I do think it'll be interesting to see. How you manage uh, the process through to its objectives is technology. Over five years, almost all of the technology you're now talking about is going to change. And how you manage that change process and what efficiencies that adds and, uh, and how it makes the project easier to do, I, I'll be curious to see. I'll be eagerly watching. So we, um, in the contract, we add you know, variety of flavors like corrective, preventive, mm -hmm. adaptive, perfective kind of buckets. So if the bugs, then you go to the corrective. If we have a end of life software, then we go to the you know adaptive. So we built in in the contract how we will do it, what the change order will come out, if we have a perfective, if it's only corrective, we don't have to pay anything. So we built in our in contract that way. Mr. Archman, was that it? Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Rosensteel? Well, let me add my congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been a, a, a great process to watch, and it's nice to see that we're, we're at the point now to award the contract and move forward. Um, and I, and I, 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 I found the, the whole process very interesting and, and very, very, um, um, it seemed like a process that was really designed to make sure we got the best um, uh, transact the best the best arrangement the the best contract uh, the best plan. Uh, one question. So there there were there were um, there was one thing in the in the write up that I that I, I I was both very happy about but I also have a question about and that's when um, there was a discussion of cost and uh, and the the CGI Sagitech proposal was quote much less than the number two firm. So. I always like that. I always like the idea we're getting the lowest <laughs> cost, like much less? but much less. I want to make sure. I guess my question is, if they were the same price, would CGI mm -hmm. Sagitech still have been our preferred choice? And I'd like some 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 idea as to give me some comfort that the fact that it's much less is that we're still paying them to deliver the product we want. And and maybe I know we have a independent pricing consultant. Maybe they could comment on that too. Your, your choice, your, uh, who would like to respond? Is you, Peggy, or do you want to go first? Well, I would, I would like to respond because I think, sure. first and foremost, this is a business-centered product. And what I heard from our business staff is that this is the product that will be the most effective and efficient for the system, for the system's um, staff to utilize that it is a comprehensive system that was designed for the very business that we're in. And the other product that we looked at had, a, um, had an equally robust outcome, but it wasn't structured the same way, and it didn't have the complete integration of all of the pieces. It required more interface development within the, the tools themselves, and that re represented, I think, additional risk. So the business people who evaluated 
and saw the demonstrations and talked with the end users at other systems believed that this was the best value and the best uh, model for us to implement regardless of price. I just want to add, yeah. you know, the solution itself, it just is a full-blown solution. It's just not like you have end user has to click here and then go back and someone else or in the second screen, three, four more clicks. So it's in there in the dashboard. So they can turn around quickly. So, um, Paul, I'll, I'll answer the dollars and cents question, then ask Steve to come up and, and um, give you some assurance from Pace's perspective. The differential depends on how you slice the numbers. So what we evaluated on is not the same as what we're actually buying. And when you look at what we're actually buy, buying, the variation is much less. So if you actually look at pure service implementation costs, the difference is very small. So in that high risk cost area, it's very small. It's under 5%. I'm sorry. Can you so that? I'm so sure the, 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 bid, the way we evaluated the bid had components yeah. in terms of ongoing maintenance and support and options that we're not buying. And a lot of the variation was, was in those items. So if you look at the core contract components in terms of what we're buying, the variation overall is about 16%. And if you look at the service line, the implementation service line, it's only about, it's very small, under 5%. So it really is a matter of where the numbers varied. And I think I can say with confidence that having gone through the BAFA process, I understand why there are differences. And, um, and again, from um, Pace Harmon's database, I think we have a good comparable to market. So, Steve, Spence, I don't know yeah, if you want to. Yeah, yeah, the independent. Yeah. yeah. Just weigh in on that uh, question by Mr. Rosenstiel. And would you identify your, yourself first, please? Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Kiertz. I work with Pace Harmon. And I appreciate the question very much. I think it's an excellent question. And if, if uh, just for my own, uh, for my own understanding, if you could bring it really down to some very basic <laughs> language, <laughs> language the difference the in level cost. of the board. For my, for my, for sure. Own. Sure. So um, I think that Peggy actually answered the question in the the right way at the beginning, which is it wasn't so much about the price that drove this the selection, right? It's the solution for the business. Um, but our role in pricing was to help everybody involved understand at a very detailed level, how is this solution going to be created? And that meant not just the number of resources that we're going to be working, but how many hours they'd be working, when they'd be working, across what work streams they'd be working, and where they'd be doing the work, here, somewhere in the US, or overseas, all of those things. So that everyone had a clear understanding around timing, around number of people, and when certain deliverables would be achieved, and when folks would be paid for those things. I think Robin's point is, um, also very important. When you look at just the hours to implement, to build, to code something, the two solutions look very, very similar after BAFA, which I think is another testament to the success of the process and the way it was run. I think both of the solutions and the folks who were bidding, or all four, had a very clear understanding of what CalSTRS is looking for. <clears throat> The big gap that I think is mentioned in the write-up um, is something you see when you look at some of the additional options and some of the post-implementation costs where warranty and maintenance and operations um, were very, very different in cost from the two final suppliers, um, sometimes to the tune of three, four, five times different. And I think that when the the team was looking at the two solutions and recognized implementations about the same, but what, what does it mean when one solution is going to cost a lot more to maintain? What does it mean when the warranty services cost so much more for another solution? I think those all ended up being important factors in the decision. 
but to build it, it was very, very similar in cost. Thank you very much. Does that help? Did I? Yeah, that does. That, yes, that does. thank you very I, much. It's the right level for. Just yeah. that. <laughs> Fourth grade. <laughs> <enough. laughs> I'm right there good. with you, Harry. Can I ask one good. more? For a oh. simple guy. Thank you. I have one more question. So, yes. so, um, and this is this gets back to, to kind of monitoring the process and making sure that it all that it all works works well because we've all we're all expressing issues with that. And um, so, when we did business direct, we we got um, a, a, a lot of very good feedback. Graham was telling us that things were, were working well. Things were, were you know, the implementation, the, the conversion uh, did well. But then, but then we actually discovered that that there were some problems with the procurement module, something that we were not hearing from Graham because that was not part of his his responsibility. So, I'm trying to figure out how. So I think I think the board felt a little bit like like there. We weren't getting, we we weren't getting the full story, and and I, I'm wondering how we're going to do it differently this time, so that we are getting the, so that we don't have that kind of a surprise. And I don't know whether that's a difference in what Graham's responsibilities are. I sense that's not, um, and so I'm just trying to understand, because there's a lot of discussion here. There's been a lot of discussion here about implementation and change management and stuff like that. That's the thing that Graham doesn't tell us about. That's not his responsibility. So whose responsibility is that to get to, to inform the board about that? It's actually both. So again, going back to lessons learned, so from that, staff will be providing a lot more information in that detail, and that will also roll over into what Graham's going to report to you. We will expand some of the areas where he reported. So we took note from your dis the discussions at the time where Pretty much when the project was over, Graham's responsibility ended at that point. But what we learned from that is for this project, we are going to extend the IPOC's responsibility to that kind of stabilization period past the end of the implementation. So you'll have not only staff reporting on it, but also the independent reporting will continue as part of that stabilization period so we don't have those kind of surprises that we ran into before. So we've kind of applied that. But I, I guess I, I sort of got the sense that it wasn't in the business direct that everything was going perfectly and then all of a sudden the responsibility for which Graham was overseeing things ended and a new stage started and that's where we ran into some difficulties. But obviously we hadn't prepped for that point in time. So, so it doesn't seem to me it's just a matter of extending his responsibility to a later period of time. It's, it's, it's understanding that change management, if you will, or whatever it is, I, you know, yes, so beyond me at this point. But reporting as we go forward with this. So the, those okay. areas that we, that were kind of surprises, we've added that to the reporting as we go forward with yeah. this as well. And that will yeah. be part of Graham's responsibility. Yes. I also think, uh, based on comments from Joy and from Paul, Sharon and I, as we're working with staff in terms of when these presentations are coming forward, we have to... Uh, hold ourselves accountable. We're making sure that what we're what we're hearing from the yeah. board is what we're getting back. So Sharon and I will talk about making sure we we communicate with staff and as with the agenda items that are coming forward that we're meeting the expectations of the board. Okay, great. Good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And I think as somebody intimately involved in that, you know, some of it is about what you, knowing what you don't know or just understanding mm -hmm. that there are things you don't know and that that probably is going to be part of any process, not. Mr. Zeiger? So I, staff will forgive me. I want to pile on with the congratulations. Thank you. I think you've done a really nice job on this. These, um, as I mentioned on one or two occasions in the past, I've had some experience with these kinds of programs on a much smaller scale. And I know that they are extremely hard to do. On a scale like this, it's it's almost unimaginable. But I do have one question about it. In my experience, of course, which would, is possibly the only experience that matters in the world, um, who, who you actually get on the ground from your contractors matters a great deal. In, our, in my instance, we ran into some trouble when we had less than the first team. Have you worked into your operations 
uh, some oversight to make sure that you really are getting from your contractors the people you need to get. Uh, I know we're a big contract, but we're not your only contract. And, and um, you, can, you can get very badly held up if you don't have the right people on the ground doing the work at the time you need them. And I, I just wonder if there's some process built in to make sure you're getting the people from the contractors you need at the very time and moment good, you need them. That's a great question. That would be good to hear from them, too, for a minute, just about sure. that the competition that you work with. Come on up, gentlemen. I think it's a fair question. Are we, are we drawing on FTB resources here? Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or are you or doing CalPads? <laughs> or, uh, you know, because that's something we actually uh, thought about. Are we mm -hmm. sure watching other big public pension funds that were bidding at the same time? And Texas Teachers was out there and others. And we wondered if that would affect the uh, quality of the team. So uh, I'm glad you asked that, Rich. Sure, and, and, and I actually uh, asked Cheryl to come up here and, and talk a little bit uh, about, uh, about this because she's personally going to engage in this. And, uh, and we actually have had many conversations about how do we make sure that we do have the right team because uh, there's been a lot of discussions about, uh, about how, this, um, uh, how, we, how we employ lessons learned from other projects, both those that are successful and those that are challenged. And, and it does come down to, uh, to having knowledgeable people and the right people, not just a lot of people, but the right people. And uh, we spent a lot of time over a three-year period making sure that we did have that. So Cheryl, do you want to? Certainly. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Cheryl Hotelling. I am the account manager for the state of California for CGI and also the account executive on this uh, engagement and have enjoyed uh, working through this process, as anybody can enjoy a Three-year procurement process, <laughs> but we're happy. We're happy to be uh, to be here today. I, I fully agree uh, uh, with the last comment that it really comes down to the team that you have on the ground. Uh, CGI has has a rich history in, in California. We have over a 220 member base that is located in California, in Sacramento. Uh, to deliver the project. We are teamed with Sagitech. The process required that we identify key staff and additional name key personnel that went through a rigorous um, resume reference check interview um, orals with uh, the CalSTRS evaluation teams through the process. We are going to deliver all of those people. They have, um, as we told the evaluation team, you have on this project on an on-the-ground basis, you have the product developer of Sagitech and a partner with Sagitech and Mr. Shepard, who is in the audience with us now. He is your assistant project manager. The project manager, <laughs> the full-time project manager, Mr. Nichols, would have been here today but was called away on um, another uh, um, emergency, so he couldn't be with us. He actually is um, another partner with us, Encore, and he is the... Um, he is one of the partners in that business and was one of the primary people working for Accenture at the time that dealt with some pension issues across the river that some of you may have heard about. So he is your project manager. Um, I will let I will let Rod talk about some of the other Sagitech folks, but know that you do have the A team. They have been fully vetted, and we're fully committed. I am committing my time personally on this project. Um, as as George is sitting next to me within CGI, we have a very flat organizational structure. So uh, there's myself, there's Dave Delgado in the audience, there's George, and then there's our CEO. That's it for a 68,000 person company, um, global company. Um, you have partners in all of the companies here on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. We are here and committed to make sure this project is successful for you. And I, all I would add to that is that I'm Rod Shepard. I'm one of the founding partners of Sagitech. I live in Roseville. Up till now, up till this project, my responsibilities are delivering all of our projects across the United States. I'm the, I'm the head of delivery and I was on the original design of Neospin, and I've been on the design of all the new functionality throughout the entire life cycle of the product. I'm taking a little sabbatical from running the company, and I'm going to be your assistant project manager. So that's as big a commitment as you're going to get out of us. Um, it's, <laughs> that's a big one. 
So um, along with those lines, we took um, very key individuals with tremendous experience in pension and our product in Neospin, and we named them in your proposal, and we promised them to uh, CGI contractually. So we think we've put together the A-team, literally the A-team. We think you're a tremendous client um, and so valuable to us, we just couldn't see doing it any other way, to be quite honest with you. So we're 100% committed with our staff to do the right thing. Anything else, Mr. Seiger? I just want to, I just, in, in my experience on this, if you perceive the risk to you is a failing, is as great as, the, as we perceive the risk of failing, it's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be that you are as, you have as much skin in the game as we do on this in terms of, in terms of uh, making sure this succeeds. And that, you know, it's, we're really nervous, but I hope you are too. <laughs> <laughs> These things are hard to do. Before I turn it over to Mr. Boykin, it's been said uh, here, and we really believe in this, a promise made is a promise kept. Oh, there you go. Absolutely. Mr. Boykin. I was just going to add, when you referenced Mr. Nichols, what you didn't add is he was part of the turnaround team. He's an ultra marathoner, oh. and I think there's a certain um, affinity between what <laughs> we're go. launching into <laughs> an ultra <laughs> Absolutely. And turn it over to Ms. Dillon. All righty. So I am ready to offer up a motion to authorize staff to enter into the contract with CGI and for them to provide our pension administration system and implementation services. Six-year contract. Do I have to say how much? No. Should I say how much? As recommended by staff. As recommended by staff. And... Um, also with that, um, I'd also move that we um, adopt the revised budget, project budget um, that is in the item before us. So it's moved by... Okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay, so CGI contract for six years at a cost of dollars and that our revised project budget is $229,164,000. So it's moved by a sec, a move by Ms. Dillon, uh, the staff recommendation as it appears on TRB 48, and there was a second by Ms. Hendrick. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, roll call. Is this a roll call vote? Or? Okay. No, but you should have a second. Yeah, the second was by Ms. Hendrick. Yeah. For, uh, made, the motion made by Ms. Dillon. Second by Ms. Hedricks. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Congratulations on the work. We're going uh, we, to break until 3.30. Yeah, yeah. We're going to start at 3.30. Turn it over to uh, Grant Boykin. You want to let me buzz you in? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to briefly announce a new year. It's a time of transitions, particularly so at the Treasurer's Office. And I wanted to introduce, for the sake of the board, Calster's staff, and our regulars in the audience, a new member of the Treasurer's Office team. Of Eric Lawyer, who actually I have to head back to the office, so he will be replacing me on the dais soon today. Eric has been with the Treasurer's Office for about two years, and the bulk of his work has been, well, in addition to helping us do some staff work related to CalPERS and CalSTRS, he's been working on the California Secure Choice Retirement uh, Savings Investment Board work. And later today in Jack's CEO report, he's going to give an update on state initiatives. So I think it's, it's fitting that Eric is here because it, um, he's probably got additional information on what's going on with the Treasurer's Office. Uh, yeah. Mr. Lawyer, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lawyer, welcome. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, with that, um, let's go to item 13. I'm going to turn it over to our CEO, Jack Enos. Jack? Yeah, let me just uh, set this up for you. Um, this is a, an important project we had in our research plan for this year. Um, and if you remember back in 2013, we did an economic impact study for you of the benefit payments um, that are made to our hundreds of thousands of retirees. 
Um, that data has turned out to be very valuable in educating all types of people in California about CalSTRS, whether it be legislators, policymakers, media people. Uh, we slice and dice that data by legislative district, by, by counties in different ways to really show um, just how significant those benefit payments have been in, in California, particularly in rural districts, which greatly surprises people just how big the education population is as residents. Um, and then you ask for a companion study really looking at the impact of the portfolio itself relative to the investments made in the state. Um, and that's no easy question to answer to actually, uh, because of the complications of a, a diversified portfolio like ours, it takes some extra skill. So we contracted here with Dr. Barden. And um, Dr. Barden is a formerly the senior economist at the Fisher Center at the Haas School of Business, UC Berkeley. And he's done a, a lot of research on the uh, economy of California. We thought his expertise was particularly suited to helping us understand the portfolio and its impact. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Barden now and to uh, make that presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Jack. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, to begin with, I'd like to thank uh, Ed Derman and his team at, uh, in the Research and Development Department for all the help uh, in conducting this study, as well as the uh, investment managers of the four asset classes for providing the data. Uh, the objective of this study was to analyze the impact of CalSTRS investments on the economy and specifically to figure out how these investments translate into jobs supported in the state. Now, we all know that uh, CalSTRS is, is a long-term investor and its primary fiduciary responsibility is to actually ensure stable and healthy returns for uh, to support benefit payments. Uh, however, it is possible to do good and do well at the same time. Uh, this responsibility can be compatible with investment in the state of California in its thriving economy, and it can serve a deeper social commitment to the members of CalSTRS uh, and to the long-term interests of California residents because these investments will help promote uh, the dynamic economy of the state, and in turn, which then can sustain a healthy and vibrant uh, public school system. Uh, so in short, uh, the fiduciary responsibility and the aspect of investing in the state are not contradictory uh, things. The reason, of course, why this is possible is that we are in the state of California. Had it been some other state of the union, the task might have been a far more difficult one. And the reason why uh, uh, that's, that's uh, an issue is that after all, the state of California is one of the largest standalone economies in the world. Uh, and it is also an innovative and dynamic, fast-growing economy uh, that provides a whole range of attractive investment opportunities. Uh, for various investments. It's a global leader in high-tech, in, in innovation, and in service sectors. And it has a whole range of locally headquartered companies that are globally competitive. We have been on the cutting edge of every emerging industry for decades. It's also, the economy of the state is also a, a high-tech uh, exporter of goods and services. And to cap it all, uh, it is home to high-skilled labor, and it's located on the Pacific Rim, which is the most dynamic economic region on the planet. All this implies that even if the objective fiduciary responsibility is purely to ensure healthy and stable returns, you can do that and invest in the state at the same time. Uh, how to figure out how these investments support jobs in the state. It is not an easy task. 
there are no the university accepted methodologies and uh, one approach that has been adopted in the past uh, in 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 the case of uh, pension funds and a couple of hedge funds etc is to just look at the companies that uh, have been invested in and their percentage of facilities in the state and then just apply that share to the total number of employees of that company to get the number of jobs in the state. Uh, what this actually, uh, the problem of trying to figure out this whole issue of how many jobs are there precisely in the state is complicated by the fact that uh, these are, many of the investments are in publicly traded companies which have a global presence. Uh, so isolating the impact of an investment and translating into jobs which are limited by the boundaries of the state is a complex matter. There's another issue. Many of the investments are in secondary markets where it's basically, you might say, uh, the company has already been operating for a while, so an investment in the secondary market is just a transfer from one party to another. So what really jobs have been created as such? So in order to get at all that, um, yes, the, the, the other uh, the problem with some of the methodologies that have been adopted in the past by others, which, as I mentioned, have to do with the share of just the number of uh, facilities or establishments or offices, uh, the share of those uh, in the state uh, uh, out of the total number of establishments and offices in the United States as a whole, that approach does not fully account for a number of things. One is that it does not take into account the fact that uh, many of the investments can be in those sectors where California has a disproportionate presence. Uh, and it does not take into account the differences across various uh, sectors. So what does, how does this study's methodology uh, differ? Uh, primarily, what we have done here is we have first identified the detailed economic sector of each company in which Calsters has invested. By detailed sector, I mean what's known as the North American Industrial Classification System Code. When you get that, then there are a whole range of other databases operated by various arms of the federal government, the, De the Department of Commerce, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you have the Bureau of Economic Analysis, et cetera. In order to get the share of California, California's share for each of these sectors in total US employment. So for each and every detailed NAICS code, we get what is California's share in total US employment? It differs, as you can imagine, by sector. For many of the sectors that we are uh, familiar with in high tech, et cetera, California has a disproportionate share. What do I mean by disproportionate? The benchmark here is that for the economy of California as a whole and for the economy of the US as a whole, California has 11.2% share in total US employment. So any sector that has more than an 11.2% share in the state is a sector which has a disproportionate uh, presence in the state. I will be showing you uh, some of those. So the asset classes studied have been uh, equities, of uh, the fixed income asset class, real estate, and private equity. The four of these together compi comprise around 96% uh, of uh, Calster's uh, portfolio. This slide shows uh, the total employment, the total number, the absolute number of employment in key sectors 
where Calsters has investments. Uh, the largest sector, which is an outlier, which is why I've uh, shown it on a different axis, is the healthcare uh, sector right at the bottom there. And then you have, starting from the top going down, uh, the total number of employment in the state in the various sectors. As you can see, uh, a number of uh, high-tech sectors are uh, represented there. But this is just the total employment. Now, the key uh, slide is this one. This is the one that tells you what is California's share of total US employment in each of those key sectors where Calsters has investments. If you start from the top, you'll see that quite a few of them uh, media, semiconductors, software, internet software, biotechnology, technology hardware, aerospace, and one after the other, there are these high-tech sectors, many of whom have a more than twice kind of a disproportionate share in, in the state. Uh, remember that 11.2% is the benchmark for the state's economy as a whole. So oil and gas, uh, insurance, uh, even uh, machinery, the ones right at the bottom are states where California is not as uh, represented. Those are where other states uh, have much more of a comparative advantage. What are some of the major investments by sector. Uh, these are in uh, the billions of dollars, and you have a whole range of sectors on uh, the y-axis. This, uh, let me go back to that. Uh, as you can see, not, of course, uh, the sector which has the largest number of amount of investment is actually oil, gas, and consumable fuels. And the next after that is banks. But a whole range of sectors after that are the ones where California has a disproportionate uh, presence in the US economy. And that is going to be critical when we come to the uh, numbers uh, later on. So uh, here's a slide that uh, summarizes the public equity holdings of Calsters in California headquartered publicly traded companies. Al Calsters invests in nearly half, actually 471, of the 996 publicly traded companies headquartered in the state. And for the entire portfolio comprises of around 3,156 publicly traded US companies of which 471, as I said, are California headquartered, and the amount of investment in these companies is 12.6 billion, which is 18.9% of the total in US equities. Again, which suggests that there is, in relation to that 11.2% benchmark that we have to keep at the uh, back of our mind, again, there's a disproportionate amount of investment in California headquartered companies. Uh, this is a slide that is now somewhat uh, outdated because it was done quite a while ago uh, to kind of drive home the point that it is possible to invest in the state and uh, get decent uh, returns uh, because if you look at the average return for 2013, and by the way, this is true of the five-year return and returns ending in August of 2014 when this was done. Uh, all the California headquartered companies, both the large ones, as well as all the 471 altogether had an average return that was higher significantly than the rest uh, of the portfolio. Here are the key findings in terms of the employment impact of public equities 
uh, on the state of California. The total number of California jobs of those companies where Calsters invest, or to put it differently, uh, the total number of jobs in the state touched by Calster's investments is in the range of 1.8 to 2.4 million. This is the total number of employment in all the companies in which Calster's invest in the state. Now the question then arises, uh, incidentally, most of the other studies that are out there limit themselves to this first bullet point. But we also have to ask ourselves, what is the Calster's share in the market cap of these companies? If you apply that average of around 0.32%, then you could say that directly, kind of uh, not together with other investors, but entirely due to Calsters itself, the range of jobs in the state that are supported by investments in public equities is in the region of 5,700 to 7,700. Let me come to the other asset class, which is fixed income. The one uh, key finding out of uh, the entire uh, range of uh, investments in uh, uh, fixed income is that, first of all, Calsters invests in around 2,500 different uh, corporate bonds in about 1,317 different unique companies globally. It has also investments in residential as uh, mortgage-backed securities and asset-backed securities and uh, in a range of uh, bonds of not just publicly traded firms but state agencies and private companies as well. One of the th uh, key findings is that the market value of the California associated, California connected, California related collateral that underlies the residential mortgage backed securities and the asset backed securities in which Calsters has investments is 20% of the total US. Uh, again, a significant uh, kind of tilt, so to speak, uh, in, in favor of the state. The estimated number of jobs in the state, state of companies whose bonds, corporate bonds, uh, Calsters holds is uh, in the, within the range of around 265,000 and 292,000. This is again within the state itself. If one were to do a similar share that one did for public equities, and it's a far more difficult uh, task here because in the case of uh, stocks, it's easier to know the precise holding and what the market cap is on any particular day and to get the, the share of uh, your holdings as share of the total market capitalization. It's far more difficult in the case of debt instruments. But based on a random sample of these uh, 2,527 different uh, bond holdings, uh, we get an approximate range of 0.1% to 0.2% of the total outstanding debt of these companies is held by uh, Calsters. If we apply that share to each and every one of these companies and, and, and uh, uh, jobs in the state, we get uh, a job estimate of around uh, 265 to 583. Uh, moving on to private equity. There are, uh, as of June 30th, 
2013, uh, Calsters <coughs> had global private equity uh, investments of around 22.4 billion of which 14 and a half, 14.5 billion were in the United States. There were 642 uh, private equity investments in the state of California for 1.99 billion, uh, which is again a share of, uh, I think around 13% or so uh, of the total investments in, in the United States. 13.6% of the total unrealized US uh, private equity holdings are investments in the state of California. In terms of the key findings of the employment impact, uh, I'm not going through the various technicalities of uh, uh, that were involved in trying to estimate the employment impact for private equity. I've, they are written up in, in the report. Uh, for each and every asset class, there is something different that involved various assumptions and estimates, et cetera. But the number of jobs in companies with Calsters in private equity investments in the state of California is 66. Thousand. However, unlike both for public equity as well as for fixed income investments, there's really no way that I can get an estimate of what share of the total investments Calsters has in these companies, so I cannot really do a prorated estimate here. The interesting thing, however, is that actually the private equity investments in the state are both in terms of the sectors, as well as in terms of their geography, very highly diversified across the state. Uh, they, I think I have a slide coming up, uh, which shows the, the, the kind of geographic dispersion in the state of all the private equity uh, investments. But another interesting feature of these investments is that they tend to support more jobs in cities where the household income is lower than the median income in the state of uh, California. 54% in those towns and cities uh, where the median income is lower, uh, where the, where the, where the uh, household income is lower than the median, and 46% in the relatively richer uh, towns and uh, cities. Uh, in fact, okay, here's, here's, here's uh, 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 a slide which shows across the state in investments in cities with less than median income. Uh, there's uh, quite a few investments in uh, not just clustered around in the Bay Area and around LA uh, San Diego corridor, but in other parts of the state. Uh, let me now come uh, to the real estate asset class. Uh, Calsters invests in 452 properties in California, uh, and the residential property type is the dominant one, as you can see uh, from the slide, uh, close to $3 billion of dollars of investments in residential property in the state. Uh, as a share of investments in real estate in the United States as a whole, California occupies 20%, again, which is uh, more than our benchmark that I've been uh, talking about uh, throughout. Here is a slide that gives you a heat map of properties weighted by Calster's interest uh, in, in dollar terms in various uh, uh, real estate investments and properties across the state. Uh, just as a, as a kind of, it can be noted that this is actually the only property class where 
uh, the investments are more heavily weighted in Southern California rather than Northern, all, in all the rest of the uh, uh, asset classes, uh, the investments are weighted more in uh, favor of, say, the Bay Area. Uh, what are the key findings when it comes to uh, the impact of investments in real estate in terms of jobs supported in the state? Uh, again, uh, I won't go into uh, some of the technical details. They are there in the, uh, in the report, in the study. Uh, the real estate job estimates uh, have been generated from regional input-output uh, models. These are models that take into account the interconnection between uh, and linkages between various sectors and how expenditures in one can affect the other and have this multiplier effect because someone's expenditure is another person's income who in turn spends uh, money, et cetera, et cetera, and further rounds are induced and uh, they produce uh, uh, this impact. Given the investments in the state, over the life cycle of these investments in the state of California, about 79,000 jobs have been created by Calster's investments in, in real estate. One can also, uh, with the help of these uh, input-output uh, models uh, estimate that approximately five and a half billion dollars of additional economic activity was generated because of these investments. So here's a quick summary of the investments and uh, in the US as a whole for each of these asset classes. California's investments in California uh, I mean, Calster's investments in California, what's the share of those total investments in the United States that falls on the state, and then the percentage? As you can see, for practically every class of asset class, the Calster's investments are more than 11, have a greater share than 11.2%, which is kind of the benchmark for the share of California's economy in the United States in, in, uh, as a share of the US as a whole. Uh, for the investments as a whole, 15.2% of total Calster's investments fall on the state of California, about 19.3 billion. What are the estimates of jobs by asset class? This is the summary slide. If one were to look at just the first column, which is what most of the studies out there do, then the 189-odd billion dollars of Calster's investments support approximately 2.2 to 2.8 million jobs in the state, together with other investors. If one were to then prorate it by the Calster's share of total investments, which is trying to figure out only Calster's uh, contribution to the uh, uh, job creation issue in the state, then we come up with an estimate of about 85 to 87 thousand jobs. Uh, I think this, there are, there are a couple of ways of looking at it. People might say, you know, there are 190 billion dollars of investments out there, of which around 130 odd billion, 127 billion are in the United States, uh, about 19 billion are in the state of California. 85,000 jobs does not seem like a lot. I've heard this when, I, when the report first came out. <coughs> but I would uh, urge you to look at a very simple another analogy. The entire market cap of, say, Apple Incorporated is about, I don't know what, 600 billion or something like that. 
and the total number of global jobs in Apple is 80,000. Globally, not just, not in California, not in the US, but globally, they have around 80,000 odd jobs. So there are two ways of looking at it. One is that Calsters is, uh, institutional investors like Calsters have a very important role to play in sustaining and boosting the state's economy and the jobs here. Very few investors can provide the long-term stable investments that uh, 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 an investor like pension fund like Calsters can and with its commitment to stable and healthy long-term returns. Uh, so this, even with other investors, if one were to look just at the higher number, I think one can make a claim that together with these other investors, uh, Calsters does end up supporting about two to 2.8 million jobs which have been kind of affected, touched by uh, the investments that Calsters has made in all these various asset classes. Uh, I'd like to thank you for, thank you. Um, just had a question regarding the um, <coughs> figure two, where you have the employment um, sectors where Calsters and Calsters. Just get some clarity about um, how you define healthcare. Uh, good question. As you see, it does not include, I'll tell you what it does not include, then you can see that it includes everything else. It does not include pharmaceuticals, they are up there. It does not include biotechnology, it does not include healthcare equipment and supplies, everything else. <laughs> These are, uh, this is not a classification uh, made by me. Uh, there are a whole range of different sectoral classifications. Uh, the most detailed ones, as I mentioned, are what are known as the NAICS uh, ones done by the Department of Commerce. And uh, these are actually uh, the broader kind of sectoral classifications used very frequently in the financial industry. So uh, your in, uh, investment managers actually look at these. Sectors. They're not scope oriented. Right? What, what's that? They're, they're not uh, scope oriented. No, no. So I have to then do a matching between each of these large sectors and next codes, depending on each and every individual company that belong to each of these large categories because they could sometimes differ. If, for, if you look at, say, uh, uh, any large publicly traded corporation, it does not just have one next code. They have a whole range, but they belong to just one of these big sectors. So then one has to look at each company and see which are the ones that I can kind of uh, associate them with. And in many cases, uh, we had to end up averaging for a number of different uh, NAICS codes so as to get the actual share. Thank you. Thank you. So there are uh, two other committee members that are in the queue. Um, being mindful of the time, I would just ask, you know, this is an information item. So uh, let's just be sensitive of the time. I'm going to ask the staff to post this report uh, on our website. And Dr. Barden, I'm sure, would be available via email or follow-up conversations that any of us may have individually. So let me go to Mr. Lawyer. Uh, oh, excuse me, Ms. Dillon and then Mr. Lawyer, and then we'll close out the item. Um, Jack, I was just curious. Um, 
How does this compare to these types of reports we've had in the past? Are they pretty comparable? Are we seeing a, a growth? Do we know? So this is on the investment side. This is the first time we've done one in this format, actually. I don't really have a comparable one with this approach. Okay. Do. So we've just broken them out by legislative district. Well, the ones in the past were the were on based on the benefit payments okay. made in the, in, okay, in the economic end. So this was meant to be the companion to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I add something else? Uh, <clears throat> the two point two million to two point eight million figure overall uh, compares very favorably with your report of your cousins across the river. So. Final, we like hearing that. Final question or <laughs> comment, you sure, get the final yeah. word. Um, can we go back to table six? I just had a quick question. Um, so it, oh, it shows. It's, in the it's not here, but it's in the report, right? Um, I believe it's one of your slides. Oh, it is, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just, just the, I was just curious about something. Is It, it shows um, CalSTRS' mm -hmm. investment share in California by uh, different Seven. sectors. And say, uh, for example, real estate uh, CalSTRS has a 20.4% share of investment in California. How does that track with, say, California's share of the real estate market Very compared good. to other states? Excellent question. Actually, the answer is there in the report, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, no, because you're absolutely correct. Uh, the reason for my using the 11.2% is very simple, because we are looking at primarily the employment impact, and that is the kind of benchmark. But you're absolutely right. If, let's say, California had 80% of all real estate in the United States, it wouldn't be a surprise if it were disproportionately represented. You're exactly right. Uh, I actually uh, did an estimate of the total real estate, residential, and commercial value in the United States and in California. The 20% is a little bit higher. The total value of California located real estate, both residential and commercial, is about between 18 and 19% of the total US. That wasn't the case some years ago. A lot of it is, as you can imagine, the housing market. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs>